Tori is doing our social media. There are special guests. Please network with them. And then to promote, if you've got questions, um, send them to Jack and Tori at development at inventoriamd.com. We are in development, so we have inventoriamd.org and inventoriamd.com. So, so you get all the latest, greatest, and connected to the meetups and the social media. Please email your current email address before um, before tonight and the meeting's over. And if you need help and you want to handwrite it and hand it to them, there's that option too. I am so excited. The room is just a real buzz. We're starting to really connect. We're really starting to grow our community. And, and we're starting to capture um, the resources of the digital world and, and the online stuff and keep us all connected because we all come with our own inventions and our own horse of things that we're hoping to learn. And through this platform, we can serve you better. There's a lot of brain trust in the room and there's a lot of new people in the room. So um, the more we get the opportunity to network the, you know, the disparate groups, we come away all being better for it. So I will always endeavor for that goal. So tonight, if you don't know about our speaker, Ken Johnson. Uh, Ken, did you know when I first started coming to these meetings in 12, 13, you were the first speaker I saw? <laughs> so he really did motivate you. He's incredible. Um, he motiv motivated me. And hello. I'm going to sit you next to this lady here who's a fashion designer. Okay? I was hoping you'd come. Welcome to Chadwick. Chadwick. Chadwick, it's cool. We're pretty easy going around here. Right. So, um, I'm going to get Ken started. Um, we're grateful for his time and what he gives to our group. And the other thing is, Ken, if you've seen KenJohnsonSpeaks.com, there's a whole host of information um, if you're a one-time inventor that he's been able to catalog on his website through the years. So um, everybody's well served by, by visiting Ken's website. And tonight, he's prepared a new presentation. It's called The Simple Plan, Six Easy Steps to Make Millions <coughs> from Your Ideas. He'll be discussing licensing, marketing, prototyping of inventions, and he's also invited two special guests. So I'm excited to learn what they have to, to say in, a, in their panel conversation with us. And then, did, did Kathy give this to me right, Ken? You're going to provide a free copy of your soon-to-be-published book? Yes, I'm going to have it tonight, so. Okay, to be stay so tuned. So hey, you, give me you know what? We're launching a new website. You get yourself you get yourself signed up there. You're, you're in the loop. You're connected. So let me tell you a little bit more about Ken. In 1979, he started a manufacturing company that produced games. And in 87, he licensed the manufacturing and distribution rights to all your products. And his most successful game is the world's bestseller Phase 10 card game. And it's available at every game retailer in the country, wow. including Walmart Target. And he receives royalties from worldwide sales. You've maintained your intellectual property ownerships over all your product inventions. <coughs> and currently, your licenses include uh, licenses with Mattel, Ravensburger, and Magimic. And that's just scratching the tip of the iceberg. So, Ken, would you join us, please? Thank you. Okay, so before I start talking about uh, a little bit of my story, because I, I basically tell the story because you want to know why should you listen to this guy. So I've got to tell you a little bit about myself. But primarily, I, I would like to answer your questions. How many of you came here with specific questions in mind that you'd like to walk out with an answer? Okay, so a good, good number of you. So there will be plenty of time for questions and answers. And my special guest tonight will be able to help as well. Uh, because they both have licensed uh, products and one has a patent, well they both have patents as a matter of fact, and they've done quite well in their uh, specific uh, uh, endeavors. So I think that's important that you get as much information from a variety of sources as possible. And of course there are other individuals here, uh, members of the board, that can answer some of your questions as well, so I look forward to those discussions. Now, I normally start out looking at this picture 
Anybody know who this is? Okay, from what movie? The Nutty Professor. The Nutty Professor, yeah, right. Okay, when you walk into a potential licensee, do you know what they see? This is what they think of when you walk in as an inventor. No, seriously. They think this. Or maybe this. But this is what they see. So, at some point in that, I want to discuss with you how to approach a licensee so they don't see you as this or that. Okay? So let's talk about that later. A uh, little bit about my story. So, as, as um, Maria mentioned, I started a, license, a manufacturing company, actually in my parents' basement in Detroit. And I was 19 at the time. And this was my first game. It was called Dice Baseball. Anybody heard of it? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's your last talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, I got it into Kmart. Kmart at that time was the biggest retailer in the country, yeah. headquartered in Troy. The building is still there, Kmart is not. That building's just empty, it's been empty for a number of years. They can't even figure out what to do with it. But I got convinced the buyer, when I was that age of 19, maybe 20, to take in this game, and it failed miserably. Now they put it in nationwide, day one, but it didn't sell well enough to go into a, a next cycle. The toy and game cycle is two cycles a year. Other industries is different. Fashion might be four. But in toys and games, it's two cycles a year. If you don't make it after the first month or two, they know very quickly, and they're starting to move you out and bring something in. The toy and game industry is not all toys and games. Okay? It's very difficult to break into. It's very difficult to stay there. The reason for that is there are over 2,000 new games invented every year. More than 2,000. Now, there's only so much shelf space at Walmart, Target, formerly Toys R Us, and all the other retailers. There's only so much shelf space. So it's very difficult to get in, and even more difficult to keep your spot. You have to sell at a prescribed level, or they're going to move you out. So that game was moved out. Uh, I got a call. It went in, in somewhere around October, no, I'm sorry, August or September. And by October, November, I got a call saying they're cutting it. So I was deflated, of course. But I thought, well, I'm going to try this again. So I came up with uh, phase 10. This wasn't the package then. It was, looked a bit different. But I came up, this is probably the fifth iteration of the package. We change the package every four or five years to give it a fresher look, keep up with current graphics, or whatever the case may be. So, um, in fact, I have a new package I'll show you in a second. It was 1982, and it was shipped to Kmart, 20 stores. That first thousand or so games, my friends and I, in my parents' basement, produced them. So I bought all the components from different companies, I bought, had custom decks built, I bought instructions from a local printer, had the tuck boxes, which is what the boxes are called, tuck boxes, uh, produced in northern Michigan. And they were all those components came to my parents' house. I bought the machinery, the shrink machines, uh, blister machines to package those games. The assembly line process in my parents' cramped basement, cold and damp, with a couple of high school friends. We shipped to those 20 stores. They bought that game on a one-time basis, meaning once those 20 stores sold out, there was no obligation to buy any more. Uh, but they saw it was selling pretty quickly. So the buyer, about a month after that first shipment, said, Ken, we'll put it in 50 additional stores. Those first 20 stores, by the way, were in Metro Detroit. The additional 50 were in Chicago. And one little aside, when those 50 stores were shipped, back then you shipped to the individual stores. These days, you ship to distribution centers. They have probably eight or 10 around the country. Uh, now, then you ship to individual stores. So I knew the address of every store those uh, 20, uh, those packages went to, all around Metro Detroit. So my friends helped me assemble the game and said, Ken, 
one of them thought he had a bright idea. Why don't we go to those 20 stores over the next week or two, and we'll buy all the games. <laughs> right? Buy a couple this day, a couple three or four the next day. It'll sell out, and they will reorder and buy more. Right? Right. right. Sounds like a good idea. Uh, maybe? No. Uh, I declined. Now, why do you think I said, ah, I don't think I want to do that? I would have gotten more stores, made more money, but I didn't want to do it. The reason I didn't want to do it is, yes, I can convince the buyer to buy more. He would probably buy them on a one-time basis as well. But I'd get more uh, games out there, but I didn't want to do it because my feeling was I wouldn't know if it was going to sell. Right. Right. Right? I could convince the buyer, but I wouldn't know. And I wanted to know. I wanted to know if I had something with real potential. Oh, I didn't want to fly by night thing, and eventually we're going to figure this out, and I'm out of business. <coughs> so we didn't do that. But what I did do was, with a clipboard, every week I drove to those 20 stores all over Metro Detroit, and I literally took inventory to see how many games it sold from the previous week. And I could see, you know, start with 12, next week they got 10, the next week maybe 6 or 7, next week they're down to 3, that sort of thing. So I knew it was selling selling on its own. So then that's when I went to the buyer and said, give me more stores. He gave me 50 more. Three months later, he gave me 800 more. Mm -hmm. Now, again, this is one-time orders. No obligation to buy any more. But at that time, I don't know if it's still true, but at that time, the individual store managers had the ability to order on their own. So these 800 store managers Many of them said, look, this is selling well. I'm going to buy more. <coughs> so they placed orders with the headquarters to buy more. And the buyer is seeing this, that his individual store managers think this product merits more purchase. So they started buying more and more and more. And I went from 12 per case uh, per order to 48, 96 a gross, which is 12 by 12, 144 units from one store. The buyer seeing this and he says, we got to put this on what's called a basic stock listing, which means it's required to be in all the stores at all the time. And that was about a year and a half from the first 20 to basic stock, and then the game kind of took off from there. And I started getting letters from around the world, and this was puzzling to me at the time. Um, how is it that people in Libya, <laughs> the UK, of course Canada, yeah. Australia, are writing me letters, this kid in Detroit, trying to get more Phase 10 games, or where can we buy these things? But I found out that people would come here visiting for whatever reason, or visiting family <coughs> members for whatever reason, and if they didn't buy the game, someone else introduced it to them, and they'd go back home to wherever that was, even in Florida and other parts of the U.S., where they couldn't find it, and they would ask, they would wonder, where could they buy this game? They would start walking in their local stores asking for this game. <laughs> now, at this time, we're only in Kmart nationwide and uh, the Meyer chain uh, throughout the, I think you were in the tri state area at the time Michigan, some uh, Illinois, a little bit of Ohio. I think it was just 30 or 40 stores of Meyer at the time. Now they've got like 230 stores. And by the way, Meyer from day one bought the game. That shipment of 20 to Kmart also went to Meyer. We shipped to all their stores. And Meyer put it in a basic stock immediately, day one. Mm -hmm. And it's never been delisted. So we've been very fortunate after 30, I hate to admit it, but it's been 37 years. Awesome. <laughs> we've kept it in all the time. Awesome. And so it's Kmart as well. Um, so uh, it, it did quite well. And I was telling Karen uh, out, out here earlier. We had, it took us about five or six years to eventually land Walmart. <clears throat> and that's going every year to see them in Bentonville, which I want to tell you how challenging it was to get into Bentonville, Arkansas 30 years ago. It was a real challenge. There was no international airport. We literally flew into, well, you don't want to go to <laughs> It was a challenge. So anyway, we went down there every year for five or six years. They would not buy it. They gave us a hundred four different reasons why they would buy it. What finally got them to buy it was one of their store managers in Bentonville, not Bentonville, but some other, I think it was Fayetteville or some other city in Arkansas, 
had been um, seeing that he was getting a lot of people coming in asking about this game, phase 10. So he figured out a way to buy it from us directly, and he bought a gross, again, 144 pieces. He sold them in less than 30 days. Wow. Now, in the toy business, game business itself, 144 games in less than 30 days is tremendous. It's, it's unbelievable. So uh, he then called the headquarters and said, look, why don't we sell this across the whole chain? What are you guys doing over there? And so the manager of the toy uh, department at that time at the headquarters decided to call us in to come down and put it in Walmart. And we went in Walmart, basic stock, day one, and we had a look back because it really took off once it got into Walmart. Walmart is the number one retailer uh, today of all toys and games in most categories they're in. They outsell Amazon, Target, Toys R Us. Walmart's number one. Yes, it is. So it really kind of took off at that point. Um, we, we sell it internationally, uh, probably 22 countries, uh, Greece, India, we just picked up probably two years ago, uh, France, I just started seeing that country on my royalty statement about six months ago, um, and uh, a number of other countries around, uh, mostly Europe. Uh, Australia and New Zealand, for the last 25 years, it's been selling there. So we've been very fortunate. It's been selling around the world and selling well. Uh, in some countries, we have to alter the game to appeal to that particular culture. So in Germany, Phase 10 is one of their tops. It's, we outsell Uno in many years. <laughs> Uno, by the way, is the number one game and card game in the world. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're fortunate to be number two. Unfortunately, I have to have the name Uno on my package, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> uh, why is that? Uh, well, you know, our manufacturer is Mattel. Oh. Mattel has the ownership of Uno. Mm -hmm. So they try to promote Phase 10 by saying, hey, we all, this is from the people that make Uno. If you love Uno, you're going to love this game. Right. That's their motivation. I don't know if it makes any real difference, but yes, that's it does. Yeah. Um, quickly, over the years, we've produced other versions of it. The Master's Edition, uh, we came out with, with that one in 2000. It is a hot seller in Germany. Um, so is the board game. It doesn't look this, it's not in this package, but in Germany, the board game does very well. They like, they, both these games, the strategy is a little bit different, plays a little bit different. Uh, the board game's a bit faster. If you, how many of you have actually played Phase 10 before? Okay, so you know it can take a while to play a complete game. Uh, this one plays much faster, probably half the time. Um, and then the dice version, has been in the marketplace for probably 24, 25 years. The interesting thing about the dice version is I did not, I created all these uh, extensions. Okay, the, the kids version, the board game, and masters. I did not create the dice game. Yet I received royalties. Why do you think that's true? The name. The name, I own that, I own that name. So if they wanted to call it phase 10, which they wanted to do, they have to pay me royalties. Mm -hmm. It was built upon the concept that you wanted to start with. Exactly. It was also built upon my copyright. Mm -hmm. Right? So mm -hmm. they can't produce that game without my okay. And my okay comes with, you've got to pay me royalties. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I didn't pay royalties on that game. I didn't even create it. I can control it, but I don't. I didn't create it. Any questions so far? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> Um, tiny bit off subject, but on the question of referencing Uno, initially I'm not familiar with it. I apologize for not knowing anything about this. Um, but it looks awfully similar to the Uno game in and of itself in terms of its color scheme and the kind of fonts that it's using and the way the cards are presented. Did it originally look relatively like that, or did Mattel Unoify it? To I mean, obviously your packaging and whatnot has changed over the years. But was it a conscious decision on your end, <coughs> I suppose, to Uno it up a little bit, or was it theirs to try and disperse it out further? Um, actually, the color scheme, the only commonality between mm -hmm. Uno and Phase 10 yeah. is the package size and the number of cards in the game. Um, but it's intentional to try to package it in a similar size. Yeah. 
to accommodate the shelf space. Um, let me go a little deeper. So when I created this game, my intention was to develop a game that would ultimately, um, if not compete with Uno, at least attract people that were looking for an alternative to Uno. That was my intention when I created it. And so what I did was I wanted to, in the toy industry, in the game industry, again, there's, there's shelf space. There's only so much. These items, in fact, let me show you here. They hang on these pegs. So you see Skippo there? That's this one right here. Skippo, it has three decks of cards in it. It does not sell as well as these two items, Uno and Phase 10. There's a number of reasons, but one of which is that right there. The price. The price. Oh. So they have to charge more because it costs them more to produce it. Mm. And you, it may not matter to you, that extra $2, but to a lot of people it makes a big difference. Every 5 or $10 makes a difference. A $9, a $10 game is going to sell more than a $20 game. A $20 game sells more than a $30 game. So that was uh, intentional, to keep the package size of phase 10 comparable to that of UNO. And as you can see, looking at them side by side, the packages really don't look that similar. The only commonality is the cards are fanned out. But you see, that's also true here. Okay. But it was intentional on my part. You can't come up in the toy industry, if you come up with a really strange package, size, <coughs> or uh, the dimensions are just odd for them on a the shelf space, they may not buy it. Buyers may not buy it from you because they're used to uniformity on their shelves. So if you walk down the aisle of a Walmart store, you'll see a commonality in sizes, and that's done intentionally by the manufacturers. So it's not to disrupt their shelf space and their flow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, that's um, speaking of this, if you walk into a Walmart today, this is pretty much what you will see. This is their current configuration of their shelf. This is all planned, by the way. Every retailer plans every inch of that shelf, and they know exactly where the product should be placed on it. And they, they put together what's called a planogram that tells the store managers, when you set up your shelf, in this case in, the, in February, January, February, <laughs> here's how you do it. They give them pictures, they give them graphics. This is exactly how you do it. Don't vary one inch. Every store, depending on the footprint, it may vary from a large footprint to a smaller footprint, but every footprint has a configuration that the store managers are required to set their, their items up in. They don't leave it up to them to figure out what to do. So this is what you see in every Walmart store of this particular footprint. Uh, where does the requirement come from? Headquarters? Or? Headquarters. Okay. Now I know that some, some suppliers will actually have a mock-up of the store in their facility yes and they have all their products lined up and, and that I'm wondering if they talk to the people at headquarters to try to get them to use their I'm sure they do every every yeah. um, retailer has a mock-up of a store usually within a warehouse somewhere where they plan this out yeah. take the photos and do all of that Meyer when I was calling on them last they took us into their store configuration warehouse and it looked you know from once you're in there it looks like a store shelves, there's products, it's all laid out. And uh, every retailer does that. Not just in this department, but pretty much every department they have. I'm not gonna have time to go through a lot of this because uh, I wanna get to your questions and I wanna have Karen and, and Peter talk a bit. But uh, I wanted to just go hit some high, high points. Um, does anybody know who this is? Now, people who've heard this before, you know. <laughs> if you've never heard this before, do you know who this guy is? I think his first name is Super, and his last name is Stoker. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> his name is Lonnie Johnson. You don't know who he is, but you know who his, what his product is. That's the Super Soaker. Ah. But he's also the inventor of a product that's even more well-known. It looks like this, but it doesn't shoot water. It shoots something else. Nerf guns. Nerf guns. Oh, my. He's the inventor of the Nerf guns as well. And he got into some litigation with uh, Hasbro probably four or five years ago over their license agreement. They weren't paying him properly on the Nerf guns. So he sued, and uh, he won the suit. They never went to anything like that. 
they pretty much folded pretty quickly once they realized he was serious. And uh, they awarded him a one-time payment to basically have him go away. And that, that one-time payment was $73 million. Oh, wow. Really? Nice. Just to go away. I mean, you can turn yourself to the... Wow. <laughs> they actually bought him out. <laughs> <laughs> they just said, look, we don't want to have it. Once you get into litigation with your licensee, it's much harder to keep the marriage going at that point. It's time for divorce. <laughs> I, I've been there with my licensee previous to Mattel, so I know. So you sold out? You sold out face then? No. We transferred the license from that company, which was Fundex, to Mattel. Uh -oh. And Mattel paid Fundex several million dollars to get that piece of paper. Wow. And then they, we negotiated my royalty agreement. So I continue to hold the IP and didn't sell it to them. I will one day, but I'm not ready to sell it now. Okay, so real quick, I just want to go over, I talk about six steps to successfully launch your product. Uh, and this assumes it's a consumer facing product. But you have to evaluate it. And I recommend you do this type of evaluation before you run to the patent office. Uh, before you spend a lot of money, there are inexpensive ways to evaluate the commercial viability of your product. Uh, the first thing you should do when you come up with a new invention is go out to every retailer you can find that's appropriate, get online, check every website, check everywhere you can to determine what, what do you think? See if it's out there already. Mm -hmm. you got to see if it's out there already. Uh, you need to know, you know, is there another product solving the same problem your product solves? Now, is it a good thing or a bad thing if you find a competing product? What do you think? Well, I'd say a good thing. Mm -hmm. It means you're in an active market. Perfect. You've heard this before, right? <laughs> no, but I... <laughs> it just <laughs> makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah, yes. It makes yeah, sense. Yeah. I've I dealt with inventors over the years, and... They come back all excited. I've consulted them and told them to go out and check the marketplace. And they come back real excited saying, Ken, Ken, there's nothing else out there like this. There's nothing else that does this. And I think that's not a good thing. <laughs> no. <laughs> because you don't know if there's a market for it. Yeah. If there's nothing that solves that problem, there may be a reason why there's nothing commercially uh, available to solve that problem. Maybe people don't want to spend money to solve the problem. They, they resolve it in some other way. Maybe the problem's not as big as you think, where people will pay for a solution. So it's not necessarily a good thing when you don't see anything competing to solve that problem. The other, the other advantage of finding a competing solution is you can learn a lot from examining those competing solutions. You can learn a lot about the market. You can learn about how well it sells. You can learn at what price point people are willing to pay. So investigate the competing products. Make sure that whatever you're offering in light of competing products is somehow differentiated from those competing products. You have to do something better than they are doing. It has to be either cheaper, not cheaply made, but less expensive to buy, or it must be somehow uh, provide more value or a solution that resolves the problem in a more efficient or effective manner. Yes. Okay, it's got to do something. <clears throat> Otherwise, you're not, you're probably not even going to get the shelf space, but if you do, you're probably not going to be successful. They probably have a head start on you. So go out, find competing solutions. That's the first thing you want to evaluate, and then evaluate those solutions. Find them, evaluate them, and then determine how are you going to be better? How are you going to differentiate your product? How is it somehow going to get some market share from the, uh, the competing solutions? And if you see a whole shelf full of comp competing solutions that resolve the problem pretty much the same way you do, at pretty much the price point that you sell yours for, and you can't somehow differentiate it, you may be wasting your time. So be honest with yourself and, and try to do a complete, thorough evaluation. Once you've done that, and it doesn't cost a lot of money to do that, the next step, in my view, some people might tell you different, but in my view is to build a prototype, if you can. 
Now, if you develop a new iPhone, it might be difficult to build a prototype. <laughs> but if you develop some widget that you can make yourself, I cobbled together my prototype of Phase 10 out of a Nuno deck that I cobbled together and was able to demonstrate the way it plays and test it. In my industry, no manufacturer, Mattel, Hasbro, or anyone else will take on a license or buy a new game without playing it. It's ridiculous in my industry to consider that my concept is somehow going to play perfectly and people are going to buy it at whatever price. No one knows what that is right now. You can't do that in my industry. You have to build a prototype and you have to play test it. When I created Phase 10, I first created it in my head and then I literally played four hands around a table myself to see if it works. <laughs> That's a good question, I don't remember. I played four hands. Went around the table. It's funny how you'll forget what the other hand was over there. <laughs> so I, I did that. And it seemed to work. I thought I debugged everything. Then I went to friends and family, um, and then strangers as well. And there's a reason for going to strangers. But I went to friends and family first, play tested it with them. And at that point, I'd written a pair of a set of instructions, and my first play testers was my sister, my father, and my mother. And I played as well. But I needed to know if those instructions I had typed up, old typewriters at that point, if they were comprehensible by someone other than me. Right. So what I did was type them up, gave them to my sister, and said, Phyllis, my, my parents were there too, I want you to read these instructions. And you tell us how to play this game. I'm not going to say anything on how it plays. I'm not going to tell you if you've got it right. I'm not going to do anything. You tell us how to play. We'll sit down and play. And she did. She read the instructions. And fortunately enough, they were perfect. At least she comprehended them perfectly. We played a perfect game of Phase 10 as I conceptualized. But during that play testing, I discovered something. I discovered that the skip card, again, if you play Phase 10, you know there are skip cards in there. Uh, at that time, I fashioned those to be the same color as one of the other suits. And there was a question about, can you use a skip card as a color in, uh, I should know this, off, in Phase 8. So I had to address that in the instructions. So that's what is, why it's so important to test your product. I think you should build a prototype, again, if you can do it without you know, going into bankruptcy, <laughs> try to build a prototype so that you can test it. You need to know if it can, there's several things. You want to know, um, is it effective at solving the problem? Is it efficient at solving the problem? And can it be built at a price that people will pay? And the only way to know that is prototype it at some point. Yes, sir. Is it okay to, uh, send it out in the field without any patents or anything within family and friends? Yeah, if you want to test it with people, it's good to get them to sign an NDA, oh. non-disclosure. You haven't gotten a patent yet. Maybe you haven't filed a provisional either. So I get them to sign an NDA, a patent. A professional might have some other thoughts, but that's what I would do in testing, particularly with people you don't know. Because the second level of testing is good to test with people that are not your friends and family but people who have the problem or experience the problem that you're, you're trying to solve. Now, why do you think that would be important? To protect yourself. Pardon me? To protect yourself, your investment. Now, why do you want to test it with people? Oh. 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 Honest feedback. Yeah. Oh, no okay. emotional attachment. Yeah. No emotional right. attachment to you. They don't, want, they don't care about your feelings so much. Your family, you know, <laughs> yeah. family will, yeah. and they may not right. want to hurt your feelings and shoot down your dreams. And they may not see something, too. Right. It's again of that emotional attachment. Exactly. And they're trying to, they want to see you get on out there and right. be successful. Right, like, and, and they're not professionals either. If you right. can find a professionals in that industry, mm -hmm. it's good to consult them as well. Yeah. Again, you do all this with an NDA or you follow a provisional patent. If you're going to go for a patent, ultimately, I follow a provisional before I get that far into testing. That's just me and what I think. You might think differently. Will an NDA protect you enough so you don't have to worry about it? Problems with patents down the road. What do you mean, problems? Well, 
you, if something is disclosed to the public. But that's the whole point of the NDA, it's a non disclosure. So you're not right. disclosing it to the right. public. Okay, all right, you by definition. I guess. Yes. Okay. Um, but you don't want to, that's a whole other issue. You don't want to disclose this to the public because then the clock starts ticking mm -hmm. on your ability to file for a patent. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Do you patent your game or do you copyright the copyright? Games are copyrighted, oh. generally speaking. I'm sorry? Games are copywritten, okay. generally speaking. Okay. There are exceptions. But you usually want to copyright a game. Okay. And there's an advantage, in my view, of copywriting over okay. patents. Okay. Uh, patents last 17 years. years after issuance. They change the rules. So now it's 20 years after filing. After filing. Oh. 20 years after filing uh, is the length of a patent. Copyrights last <laughs> lifetime of the author, that's me. Plus, is it 70 or 75? 70. 70 years. <laughs> Do you see the advantage there? What is the difference between the two? Uh, it depends on the product, the utility of the product. Okay. So if you're cop uh, uh, copyrights cover the expression. Okay. So a painting, books, music, uh, okay. game instructions, okay. uh, graphics, things like that. Okay. Uh, patents cover the utility. So the widget, the way it operates, the mechanisms involved, I mean, just okay. make it simple. Okay. So it depends on the nature of the product. So you copyrighted, let's say the name, Face 10? No, that's trademark. That's trademark. a different thing. Trademark is, trademarks last 10 years, and you have to re-up them every 10 years. You have to pay. But as long as you're using it, you can use the trademark forever. Okay. I mean, you pay the fees. So the copyright was only the direction? Yes. How much is the fee? Copyrights? Yeah. No, trademark. Um, what is that, four or five hundred dollars these days? The fees? Um, if you're filing in one class, you pay the government 225. If you're filing in two classes, like if you have a product or service that falls into one or more category, then it's 450, and plus it's whatever you pay your trademark attorney. Right. So a few hundred dollars for filing fees, and then whatever you're going to pay the attorney to do. I did my own. So it cost me a few hundred dollars. Yeah, about the price of patents, I, I, I would wear the day cost anywhere from 10000 to to 100000 per patent. Yeah. Um, you no. meet with yeah, it, and, it, and you get, they're not that expensive, and, and you might qualify for some resources. I can recommend you to a lady who, uh, who runs up, uh, she trains patent attorneys. A patent, a patent will, it varies depending on the patent, uh, if it's, uh, if it's challenged, uh, the prosecution, the what's the examiner? The examiner, if he comes back with a lot of him or her, come back with a lot of questions. You got to go back and forth a lot. Your costs are going to run up because your attorney's going to be charging you by the hour. So it just depends, you know, on, on the uh, difficulty in getting that patent issued. I mean, if you file the patent and it goes flies right through, you could probably do it for less than ten grand. Would that be fair? But they don't usually fly right through. I have the name of an attorney at PDT. Okay. We got David here too, who's also yeah. a patent attorney. He right. some comps. Would it be worth to pay that, that amount for a patent if uh, you still got to fight knock knockoffs and and oh. and, and, and uh, the, the, the litigation? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now you're getting into what I my personal opinion about patents. So you you raise an issue. Remember I said earlier I I think you, patent is not the first thing you do. Do these things first. Mm. You protect yourself with NDAs. Not everyone agrees with that, but that's how I feel. To save you from spending thousands of dollars needlessly. Now, most patents issued to independent inventors do not yield enough money to recover the cost of patent. That's not me, that's statistics. Again, just make sure you hear heard me right. Most patents issued to independent inventors do not yield enough income to recover the cost of the patent. And why? They didn't do that very first step, or they didn't do a thorough job at it. If you do that first step properly, you have a much better chance of success because you know what the market is, you know who the competitors are, you've differentiated your product from those competitors, you know what the market will pay, you know, um, the competitive advantage your product will have, you know the international possibilities, you know a lot of things 
before you spend a hundred grand, or whatever the number is, on an international patent. I've heard of people spending tens of thousands of dollars on patents, and in my view, all they bought was expensive wallpaper. That's about all it does. It's hang on their wall. Yes, sir. Uh, let's say you have a, a real good idea. Is there a way of tying that patent price into your license? Yes. Very good question. So if, if you file, if at some point you want to get a patent, that's further in these pockets. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So once you've done your general uh, market evaluation, product evaluation, and you've done a prototype, and it does everything you want it to do, it does it at a price people will pay, and it's awesome, and you can't wait to get it out there. Then uh, you've evaluated the product, and you know everything's wonderful. Then you file this provisional patent application if you want a patent. You can file a PPA. It's not a patent. It's just an application. It's the placeholder for your uh, priority, the date. That's the date of your eventual patent application. Okay. During the time after you file a PPA, you want to spend six months, again, trying to market that invention. That's what I would try to do. If you're not going to produce it yourself, which 98% of people, inventors, should not try to start a business producing their product. 98% of inventors, in my opinion, should not try to start a business producing their product. They should license it to someone else who knows what they're doing. Okay. Uh, I was fortunate. I was in the game business. Not that expensive to produce. It was a different place in time. Yes, I started a business, ran that business for six or seven years and then eventually started licensing. But that's not the norm. Most people should license. And if you can get a license agreement uh, after you filed your PPA, you get your licensee to pay for the eventual patent. And it can be written right into the agreement. And maintain that patent. And file internationally if, if necessary or need be. You get them to do it all. Everything in a license agreement is negotiable. They will send you a draft, Karen, right? They'll send you a draft, and this happened with you also, Peter. You get the draft, first draft they send you, and they're, they're standing around doing this, crossing their fingers, hoping you'll sign it. <laughs> but 90% of what's in that draft, you can negotiate. They'll say, well, we'll pay royalties of this amount. You'll say, well, I don't know, let's go with this amount. They won't necessarily include uh, audit rights in your favor. They will probably have audit rights in there, but not as favorable as they should be for you. What's a typical audit right? Uh, uh, a good audit right allows you to audit going back a reasonable number of years. <clears throat> They're not going to want you to say, we can audit going back 20 years. They're not going to like that, not because they are afraid of what you might find, but they don't want to necessarily have to maintain these records to keep them around in case Peter one day 20 years from now says he wants an audit. So usually you'll confine that right going back three, four, five years, whatever is reasonable. If you think it's a concern, you should audit more frequently, right? Sure. So you usually are confined to a specific period of time. They may say, uh, we only want you to audit during this time of year or that time of year. That's not a problem because they may have good reason for that. In the toy industry, it's very busy, as you can imagine, in late summer and fall. So they don't want auditors crawling all over their office during their busiest season. So they may confine when you can do it in any given year, how far back you can go. Uh, you want, they will say, and this is normal, you pay for the audit. Okay, Peter. You say, fine, I'm initiating the audit, I'll pay for it. But then you go back and say, if though that audit shows you underpaid me by X percentage, they pay for the audit. And most companies will agree to that. So that's a provision you, you should try to get in there. That you will pay for the audit, but if it, the audit shows they underpaid you by whatever percentage you can negotiate, three, four, five percent, whatever that number is, if that's reflected in the audit, then they have to pay for the audit as well as obviously pay what they owe. Okay. That's typical. And it won't be what you see in their draft, but that's what you'll come back with. How did you go about finding companies for licensing? Did you Google it or you know, how many So how do you find companies to license to? Remember I said this first evaluation, you're looking for competitors, right? The P 
people that are competing with your eventual product are probably the first people you're going to talk to. So in other words, if you invented a toaster, you can't go to General Motors talking about a new toaster. Right? <laughs> you have to go to companies that are already making toasters. They have the distribution. They have uh, the, the expertise. They have everything you need. You have to go to a company that's in that field. And they will recognize if, if your evaluation is proven that your product is more effective, more efficient, less costly to produce, retails at a reasonable price. Uh, a lot of companies, if they're in the business of taking in outside products, which is another challenge, but if they do that, they will be happy to look at your adventure. Because a lot of companies rely on that. In my industry, uh, this is a quiet secret, most people don't know it, but Hasbro and Mattel, Mattel the largest uh, toy company in the world, they do not invent their, their uh, new products. People bring them to them. Why would you bother? Mattel does not innovate new products, nor does Hasbro. What they do is they go to people like me and other professional inventors, professional inventors, someone that's already licensed something before, and they say, Ken, we want a new version of this or an extension on that. Can you come up with something? So they'll tell me and 10 other guys, come up with something. And then we'll meet them once a year Say, here it is. And they'll say, okay, we want that one, and we want this one, and we want the other, and we don't want that. Mm -hmm. But they don't in innovate new products. Now, they do internally create extensions on Barbie. And by the way, Barbie, it's easier to probably get into Fort Knox <laughs> than it is to get in this section of Mattel where they produce the new Barbie That's funny. iterations. That's funny. So when I toured their facility a few years ago, I mean, there's, there's guards there, literally guards there. The door has, you know, the secret pass, you know, swipe there. They don't let anyone into where they're producing uh, Barbie iterations, not even the little new dresses or whatever. Because that's a <coughs> no secret. That's fair. It accounts for probably 20% of their revenue. Yeah. And they don't want any problems. They had problems years ago with a doll line called Bratz. Have heard of this? Yeah. Yeah. Huge lawsuit, a lot of litigation, back and forth, big problems. Uh, so no one can get in to see what's going on with Barbie, and they're they're restrictive, but not as much with Hot Wheels. Uh, but yeah, they they are very particular. But yes, they they do not innovate new products unless it's with their current brands. If it's something new, they don't innovate. They go to outside inventors like myself to come up with new iterations to say Uno, you know how they have the, the device that spits out cards, I forgot what it's called. The Uno game, everybody, anyone yeah. seen this? I have one. Yeah, it spits out the cards, yeah. you know. Uh, they didn't invent that. Independent inventors did it. They said, we want something new and different, come up with it. Guys, uh, I know, created it for them, and they got licenses uh, based on that product. Yeah, Joe? Uh, is there an innovation fee with that? When they call you guys and say, innovate, they say, okay, we pay this amount to make this. Or you know, that's a good question. I don't know if they pay if they don't pay me <laughs> to come up with new ideas. Okay. Only if they take it in. Okay. It's our risk to try to create something that they'll like. Do okay. you have an NDA when you do that? Oh, uh, yes. You submit your idea? Yes. You do NDAs with everybody. <clears throat> yes, sir. Well, say you have a, have, have a uh, utility Design product that that you have evaluated for a year or more, mm -hmm. and uh, you uh, find a licensing manufacturer, uh, in, 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 and you say a uh, inventor shouldn't manufacture his own product, but then if it's it, it, if it works perfectly to the way the inventor built it, uh, <coughs> does the manufacturer have design patent change rights if if if, if, if if they design your product their way. <clears throat> yes, good question. So what he's basically saying is, if, if you have a patent and you, you give them your product, can they alter it, change it, do whatever they need to? Is that what you're basically right. saying? So yes, they have that right to do that. Um, and they will do it. Okay, at some point they will alter your product 
They will uh, add to it, make it better in some ways. They may go right out the door initially the way you invented it, the way you patented it, but they may alter it. Doesn't change your agreement necessarily with them. The problem though with a patent, I'm sorry, a license on a patented product is that license has to terminate when that uh, patent uh, expires by law. The only way to extend it is if you have some, something else associated with that license, like a trademark or copyright. And even then, it has to step down the royalty. If the royalty was 6%, for instance, inclusive of the patented product, and that part is terminated, then that royalty has to decline as well to whatever is agreed upon. When you publish something, you said uh, you know something about publishing. If you're self-published, you use Amazon on demand. Uh, I'm writing a driving safety handbook, and I've been sitting on it for 20 years. Yeah, and something like that is something that's easy to do. You can start a company doing that yourself. Self-published? Yeah. It, it, a lot of products, again, when I say the average inventor shouldn't, produce their own product, there are a number of reasons. Um, most businesses fail, right? Most businesses fail. Now you throw on top of that, you're, if you're getting into an industry you've never been in before, you don't have any business experience, um, you don't have a whole lot of resources, financially or otherwise, why are you trying to start a business around a product that you created when there are a lot of companies out there that will gladly pay you a royalty for the right to produce that product? When I started licensing, I was making more money as a licensor than I was making running my own business. And in fact, I was getting more royalties than the guy who was CEO of the company at Fundex. Is that right? Yes. And he hated writing my checks. <laughs> That's what happens. It can happen if you have a product that does well. Now, eventually he's going to outweigh me. He's building a, a company that has equity and has value. So I'm not saying he was, I was worth more than him, but I was making a lot of money and I didn't have to do anything. So I could go off and do other things, which is what I did. I went into telecommunications for 15 years, built a, a large company with 200 employees, and uh, we sold AT&T and Sprint long distance. So that's what I did right after I left production of my game. So I did other things and I had this other cushy income. So it was, it's a good way to do it if you can. I'm gonna have to get, I know we got more questions, but uh, let me have Peter uh, Langer is an inventor. You've heard him ask a few questions. He invented a, uh, a doorbell, an illuminated doorbell, but his patent is based on the mechanism inside for recharging or energizing it. You can tell them the detail. Come on up, come on up, All Peter. Right. Uh, let's hear from Peter. Uh, Peter Retired from Ford as an automotive electrical engineer. And I've been dabbling in electronics and, and circuits forever and a day. Uh, so when I retired, all of a sudden there was a vacuum and I had to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. So I started thinking about uh, coming up with new ideas uh, for doing different things. Um, for some reason, uh, I got interested in the doorbell because. Down in Florida, one of my neighbors had a push button doorbell, and on that push button doorbell, he had put an LED. And when he pushed the button, the light went off, and when he released the button, the light came on. And that itself, I didn't think, was really anything spectacular, but um, gave me an idea to try to enhance it so that we could do something with the light. Um, so, what I did was uh, I designed my own version of the same thing, basically, except that instead of having a little red indicator, I used a white LED that had a lot more horsepower, and it provided enough illumination so you could light up your front porch at night. Um, but to do that, I needed to figure out how to get more energy through the uh, chime, because that's the way the doorbell was powered. Uh, I, I don't know if you know how circuits work, but Basically, you have to have uh, you have to complete the electrical circuit, and uh, normally the doorbell, doorbell uh, push button does that for you. Um, however, uh, in 
in this case, um, I had to uh, figure out a way to do it uh, using the minimum amount of energy that I had coming through the chime. <coughs> Pull too much energy, the chime starts to buzz all the time. So you can't do that. And so I, anyway, I figured out a way to come up with an efficient switching regulator that allowed me to uh, uh, convert the energy from 25 volts down to 5 volts, and at the same time boost the current uh, five-fold. And uh, that gave me enough energy to do everything I needed to, and, uh, and so, so I could op operate the light. So that, that made, to make a long story short, uh, that was the secret to the uh, entire operation of the thing. Uh, I used a microcontroller to uh, turn that light on and off between day and night, and uh, used a photo detector to sense daytime and nighttime. Um, then. Uh, in the process of doing all this, I decided to patent the idea, so I ended up with three patents that uh, had variations on the same uh, principle. And uh, once the patents went into effect, then I wanted to, I decided I was going to try to find a manufacturer to make the doorbell, because I didn't want to, just like Ken said, you don't want to, you're better off sometimes not going into business for yourself because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, I, know the, uh, I know the technical side, the electronics, but I don't know inventory, uh, deadlines, things like that. You know, I, I have four deadlines. <laughs> um, anyway, so I went to uh, a company in Kentucky, uh, Bowling Green, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, Is it Scott? Uh, no. No, it was um, um, Heathco. They make doorbells and they sell them to Home Depot, uh, and maybe other other companies as well. But I found most of them at uh, uh, Home Depot, and so I, I found that they they were a re rather reputable uh, company. So I contacted their CEO. Worker, uh, go down there and make a presentation. And so I thought after the presentation that it was a done deal. They seemed all excited and everything. But then two weeks later, they uh, all of a sudden lost interest. So I don't know whatever happened there. So anyway, that was the end of finding a manufacturer for my idea. So the next step was what else can I do with this darn thing besides uh, manufacture it myself? So got the idea. Maybe I can license the concept to somebody that might be infringing on an aspect of the patent. Um, each, each patent that I had had a bunch of claims on it. And that's the heart of the, that's the, really the heart of the patent. You go through all the claims and they have to be well written in order to be effective. But if you have a good set of claims, you could do an awful lot with it. So what I did was, I looked at the claims and decided uh, which ones were probably being infringed by other companies that are making doorbells. And oh, by the way, this is right about the time that the new generation of doorbells came into existence. Uh, Wi-Fi doorbells, like uh, the one made by Ring, you know, and by Skybell, and both similar companies, but Ring, of course, is probably a lot uh, more well-known than uh, Skybell, um, because Jamie Simonoff, the head, uh, CEO and, and chief inventor, uh, as he called himself, um, uh, he went on uh, Shark Tank, and needless to say, he didn't convince them into giving him a deal. Um, so he ended up uh, trying it on his own. He found Richard Branson, uh, and who finally decided that he wanted to be supporter and uh, provided uh, $200 million. So that, that gave him a little bit of uh, walking around money or enough cash to move his business along a little further. 
And finally, it got to the point where the business was so well known that uh, Amazon came along and gave me $1.6 billion. Whoa. And so you know, the rest of the rest of history. Um, he's still working for the company and uh, doing well. But uh, uh, I still had this business about having to license these patents. And I decided that SkyBell was probably infringing on my patents. And uh, so was Ring. And maybe eight or 10 other companies, including some Chinese uh, companies. There's a bunch of companies making these Wi-Fi doorbells. So they have a camera, they have a microphone and a speaker. And uh, you can find out who's at your front door anytime, anywhere day or night, and just by picking up your phone and, and talking to the person that's on the other end, which would be at your front door. Uh, meanwhile, you could be anywhere in the world, almost. So anyway, that's the way those things worked. And, uh, but I was, I was to make a long story short, so I was, I was able to find out several companies that were infringing, and I picked two of them and uh, decided to go for the license, and I was successful in doing that. So, and they, the license included uh, uh, a one-time royalty. Uh, I didn't go for a periodic royalty. Uh, and I also got them to pay the maintenance fees on the patents, which came to like $20,000 or something for like you know, an 18, 20 year patent. Uh, uh, so anyway, basically that's it. Uh, I considered myself somewhat successful. It was a lot of fun. I used, used technology that I learned while working at Ford. In other words, didn't do anything totally different and unknown to me. I was very familiar with all this okay. stuff. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. All Peter. set. For giving it. Okay, so remember I said you don't want the, the um, perspective of licensee to to view you this way, mm -hmm. I told you what, I'm going to tell you why I'm going to do that before I call Karen up. Um, the reason, the way you keep the prospective licensee, and this kind of goes to the question that was in the back, from looking at you this way, is how you approach them the very first time you reach out to them. A lot of inventors will reach out to a potential licensee, and they'll either call, email, or otherwise uh, contact them. And in your, their excitement, they'll tell them, look, I got this great idea, I'm an inventor, I've invented this new product, we're all going to make billions of dollars, this is so exciting, and there's nothing else like it, there's a treat. You tell them all these great things, and they think this. <laughs> Literally, they think this. I know this because I've dealt with a lot of inventors over the years, and I know how they've approached them, I know the responses they've gotten, and I've talked to companies that look for licensed product, but they don't want to deal with this, the nutty inventor. And the way you avoid that is when you reach out to them the first time, don't tell them how great the product is. Definitely don't tell them you're an inventor. Don't tell them you have created a new invention that's going to make a gazillion dollars. Don't do any of that. Your very first contact is for one purpose and one purpose only. You want to find out if they look at products developed, not invented, developed by outside companies. If you approach it as though you're a company dealing with another company, as opposed to a nutty independent inventor, they will listen. So don't use the word invention, don't use the word inventor. You're a product developer, and your company has developed a product that meets uh, their uh, product line. <clears throat> so all you want to know in a single paragraph is do they look at products developed by outside companies? That's all you want to know. When they respond, if they say, yes, we do, they will also tell you, and here's how you submit it to us. At that point, you generally just follow their submission criteria. You may push back and say, look, uh, I'd like to present it to the appropriate parties at your company uh, because of 
whatever reasons you can come up with that you can't send it, because I personally prefer to present myself, but there's a presentation criteria that I don't have time to get into now, you know, a, a way you present to them. But when you get to that point, just reach out to me and I'll tell you how to do it, how to present. But for now, all you want to know, it takes it to take too long, all you want to know is one paragraph. Do they look at products developed by outside entities? Period. If they don't sign NDAs, they will. If they're in the business of, look, of looking at products developed on the outside, <coughs> they will send you an NDA. They want to protect themselves. Okay? Generally, that's what happens. If they don't submit an NDA or tell you that we want to sign an NDA before we look at it, then at that point you tell them, hey, let's sign an NDA. But 99% of the time, along with your submission criteria, will be an NDA. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you're saying that 98% of the businesses fail. Uh, you should say, try, well, well, something along that line. Yeah. Uh, you don't want to create a business. And I don't want to create a business. I, I, I thought about it that I want a license. But I don't want to do the footwork. Can I get a licensing agency? Uh, in some industries, there are licensing agencies, yes. I don't know about yours. In my industry, there are agents who will help you get into uh, uh, Mattel or Hasbro. If you walked in, first you wouldn't get in the door. If you created a new game, they wouldn't even look at you, talk to you. You sent that letter I'm describing, they would send you a letter back saying, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Wilson, we don't look at ideas from independent inventors. But if I went to them, they would look at it. There are other agents out there that could get you in the door. So some industries will have agents that will do that work for you. They'll be totally familiar with the process. They'll know the potential uh, licensees that you can work with, because they'll deal with more than one, usually. And so that might be a way to go, but you're going to give up something to do that. It could be a portion of the license uh, fees. It could be an upfront fee, which I wouldn't pay. I wouldn't recommend you do that. Uh, there will be something you're going to give up. Wouldn't that stop all the headache of I didn't do something right or I didn't, uh, like I said, present myself wrong? Wouldn't, wouldn't an agency protect themselves more professional than, than I would? And they know they're an agency. They know they're working with you know, independent inventors. And that's fine. They'd rather deal with someone on, on a professional level that knows the game than to deal with someone who's this. But as an inventor, when, when, when do I make that decision? What kind of things will help me make that decision? Do, do I want to do it myself, or I want to get someone to do it for me? Uh, you mean approach licensees? Yes. Um, anytime you like. I mean, you just decide if that's what you want to do. If you can find an agency that's reputable, and you have uh, concerns as to whether or not you want to deal with that, then go with an agent. But it's going to depend on the terms, the deal, and it's totally up to you. But. I would investigate it. If you're feeling now that's something you're concerned about, I would investigate and see if there are agents in that industry or industries that service the industry that you're in. I haven't seen too many. Yeah. Well, that's all part of your research. If that's what yeah. you're thinking now, yeah. research it. Okay. Um, I want to get from Karen up here. Um, she's got a great story, and you guys, we're going to be running a little over today, but you, you've got to hear her story. Uh, I want to introduce her properly here. Her name is Karen Bonici. 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 Uh, she's an entrepreneur and inventor. Um, and has worked as a performing artist while venturing into a variety of small creative businesses for over 20 years. In 2011, she landed on a unique idea while creating <coughs> gifts for her nieces and nephews on her home sewing machine. Her patented invention, Super Blanky, <coughs> part of uh, part blanket and part cake and is selling nationwide at Target. The licensing opportunity between Super Blanky and uh, Franco Manufacturing came after four years of Karen's testing, building, and learning uh, which direction to take the product in. Since launching Target, I'm, I'm sorry, at Target, Super Blanky has partnered with three of uh, Three party licensed brands like uh, Batman, Paw Patrol, and Ryan's World, and, and more to come. Karen continues her work in the creative world while 
expanding opportunities for the super lanky brand. So let's introduce, uh, bring to the platform here, uh, Karen Felici. Super Blanky, and it is a superhero cape and a blanket all in one, and I'm going to show it to you, but I, I just want to start a little bit and tell you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an artist, I'm a handmade artist, I'm a performing artist, I've been working in the creative arts for, um, well, all my adult life. over 30 years. <laughs> so, um, and I've created and made a variety of things, and my longest stint doing art shows and craft fairs, I was making some scarves and a variety of things that, were, that ultimately ended up giving me tennis elbow and carpal tunnel problems. So I thought, you know, I, I, I got to do something one time and let somebody else make it for me. Exactly. So that's where I, so I'm not like your, um, you know, like intended to be an inventor. <laughs> that's just kind of how I became an inventor. But I've always created, I've always made and created things. Um, and um, so, I made the super blankie for my nieces and nephews <laughs> as a holiday gift. Um, I wanted to give, I raised my own kids, you know, and, and there was a lot of, um, we have a lot of creative household and a lot of creative play in my house. So I made a, a superhero cape for my kids when they were little, you know, just little superhero capes. But for my nieces and nephews, I thought, oh, I'm gonna make a blanket that's a superhero cape and a blanket in one. And I took the blanket and I put on it a neckband right around here on the other side, a little Velcro neckband, and they would run around the house. But the blanket was a little heavy, so it would kind of hang a little heavy on their neck. And I thought, I, but I, the, the kids loved it and parents were loving it. We were at a restaurant when I gave it to my nieces and nephews and, and the waitresses were coming over and saying, oh, that's so cool, it's a, really a blanket and a cape in one. But I needed to do something different. And so I went back to the drawing board and back to my sewing machine, started thinking about it. And after just playing for a while, I came up with the sleeves. <laughs> and so all these are, they're two pockets. And the hand goes in, and then the hand comes out. And I hold two US utility patents on this, on that sleeve and how it functions. So I patented it. I put actually started the provisional process because I wanted to see was this going to sell. And I was doing, like you said, the research and stuff. And what I did in order to kind of do my market research, I started making them and selling them. So I applied for my provisional patent through my attorney, who I advise you get an attorney, um, and started selling them at arts and craft fairs and thought, yeah, I do have something. People do like this. So then I found some cut and sew shops in Michigan and started doing, continuing to do shows and it was just gonna be too expensive. And I learned I didn't know how to run the, the business and I knew I wanted it in a bid box. I knew the distance it could go, so I knew that I needed to back off and that's when I started researching and learning about licensing. Literally took me about a year to feel confident to know about the licensing business before moving forward. So eventually I found my, um, my License so my licensee by look, going to the store, and and I still do it. I go and I take photographs of manufacturers' names, mm. and I go back and research them. I go right into the store, right to the shelf where I want my product to be, and I just take pictures. That's how you find a license, like your licensee. So since that time, um, so I find I've been in my licensing contract for two and a half years, I guess. So since that time, the product has come out in all of these, and I'll leave these up here for people to see. So we have, and this is where I knew, you know, I kind of had this vision that the product would go, right? So I have Batman, Jurassic Park, it's not for sale. These are my samples, I can LOL Surprise, this is a Paw Patrol character, character My Little Pony, PJ Masks, more Paw Patrol, the boy, Chase character, uh, Trolls, the Trolls movie, Emoji Nation, and more LOL surprise. And then as of recently, what's very fun and exciting, so this is what the latest product looks like. And this is how my manufacturer makes it. 
Oh. Oh. Isn't that fun? It's beautiful. Yeah. So there's the sleeves, right? Wow. So you can see it looks like a real manufactured truck. It is a real blanket now. Did you have to get licenses for to use it? So my so my manufacturer, um, as the license licensee, um, has a, a bunch of uh, licensors. And they are Batman, and they are Jurassic Park, and they are Ryan's World, and they are Fallout World. So I'm a licensor, and Disney's a licensor, and we go to our licensee in the middle, the manufacturer, who brings us together, Mary, Mary's there. They make a lot more money than I do. Disney makes a lot more money on my royalty points than, than I do, as you can imagine. Um, but um, having these brands on it, it has made it very successful. And my product does sell nationwide in every single Target store. Can I say something? Yeah. 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 If you see here with the uh, phase 10, <coughs> one right here with the characters, mm -hmm. it's a similar arrangement that Karen has. It's usually called co branding. And in my case, it might be different for her. Uh, my licensee pays me a little less than normal. There's a different royalty rate when it's co-branded with another licensed product. Because mm -hmm. they only have so much room in their budget to pay out on right. royalties. So they reduce mine a little so they can bring in these guys. But I don't care that much because I'm getting another product that goes with a brand that people are familiar <coughs> with. If I had Phase 10 Kids and I created some widgeted cartoon character of my own, it's not going to sell as well as when I've got Thor and Iron Man and Spider-Man on the cover. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's why they did it with hers exactly. as well. Exactly. So. But, so my, my product just launched initially with these brands. You had had a lot more time in the, in the business and really established the <coughs> brand much bigger and stronger. So, um, and then the latest product, has everybody heard of Ryan from Ryan's Toy World? Yeah. The 22 year million dollar kid from like YouTube. Right? <laughs> He's nine now. He's nine. He's nine. So we have co-branded oh. with Ryan and came out in January. No, maybe it came out in February with his surprise egg. And inside of the, now this is by Bonkers. Well, this is my manufacturer partnered with Bonkers Toys. So this product um, sells at Target and it's currently for sale, but you can't get them. They're flying off the shelves. So it's really fun and exciting. They're not selling enough of them, in my opinion. I feel like they're keeping them off a little bit, like to kind of create that little bit of a, um, I don't know what. But it, it comes with a super blankie, and it's got Ryan's logo on it. And all my blankets do come with superhero masks. So, of course, it's got a mask. But these, these surprise egg things, it's a whole thing for the kids. It's called the unboxing kind of movement. I don't know if you've heard it. It comes with stickers and a pillowcase and some toys in here. But so Ryan loves the blanket. And we're working on possibility of doing, um, hoping that we're going to have a, this is called the, the um, sleepover, Ryan's sleepover egg working on um, the potential of um, putting a towel in it and because my patent also covers any sort of any fiber at all um, and now I'm acquiring working on acquiring the name super towel mm -hmm. so we'll have super towel inside the egg and it'll be the bath product so mm -hmm. all right. yeah. thank you Karen yes. Peter, Karen, or myself will answer any questions you have and stay as long, I'll stay as long as necessary until they boot us out and answer questions. Okay, let's start with this lady here. You said that when you go to the store, you, you take um, a product off the shelf. You take a product off the shelf, take a picture of it? I take it right off, I take it right off, and I examine it, and I go, well, who's making this thing? And it's got to be on the outside of the product. It will be okay. there. And then you just take a photograph. Okay. Now, the, what's the title of the What's the title of the person at the company who you want to ask about licensing? How do you know who that person is? Because you said, you said, uh, Ken well, Like Ken said, so you can contact a um, potential licensee or a manufacturer, and um, you can sometimes reach out to the marketing department. You can reach out to the sales department. They know what products sell. 
Um, I mean, Kev would have another uh, additional thoughts on this, but he's asking. Engineering uh, sometimes. <laughs> Engineering, yeah. you know, but I know that if you're reaching out to the marketing department, there is their job ultimately to that's make sure products thing. sell. Yeah. So I think great. that's a good direction to go if you're trying to figure out who to, if there's not an obvious, like, um, you know, open innovation department or somebody who's listed as open innovation. Uh, to the panel, how do you guys know what pricing you want to get for the license or how much you're going to sell your product for? How do you come up with that conclusion? Or does someone do that? Someone else does that for you? Well, there's formulas for that. Can you tell me on there? So it depends on the product line. Yeah. I'm not sure I heard your question. How do you determine the retail price? Yes, the price that you're going to sell to the public. Yeah. So uh, usually the retail price is determined. Uh, based on a formula, as Peter said, and it's usually, uh, let me back it up this way. Let's say a product sells for $40 at retail. Then generally speaking, that, pro that product costs uh, somewhere in the $10 range. It's usually some 75% of uh, that retail price. 25% uh, of the retail price is the cost of the product. So, it's, it works up. If the manufacturer, if it costs them ten dollars, they'll sell it to Walmart, Target, and whoever else for twenty, give or take a few dollars, and it'll, they'll double it from there. Does that make sense? That's how it usually works. And the way you're going to determine that is, that, as we talked about, when you build that prototype, and you know what materials are required to produce this at volume, not one off. So let's say five thousand or ten thousand, then you back it down from there. It costs, if you produce 10,000 of these, and you can get manufacturers to tell you these numbers. When you're going to go to the prospective licensee, you need to be armed with information as to what it's going to cost them to make it and what they can retail it for. Now, they'll tweak those numbers, but if you give them some idea at that meeting, it gets you as ahead of the game. Does that make sense? And you'll determine that based off your prototype, the materials it will take to produce this at volume, and depending on what you've created, you can find contract manufacturers who can quote you what it will cost them to build it. Say you contact a company in China, there's ways to find these companies. There are agents out there who will find those companies for you, who can produce it, you get quotes, you then take that quote, build it at a retail price, and that's what you present to your prospective licensee. One other quick can, I, can I answer that though? I will say that I know that Target was a major determining factor on the price point on this because we were hoping to sell it higher we were hoping to get it in at 19.99 but from you know target was buying a lot of product and so they said this is what we need it re to reach we know what it's going to sell this is where we feel like we want it to sell at so okay so, they, so a retailer really will retailer has a lot of strength they don't know did you guys have to buy insurance on last question uh <laughs> some kids would swallow your pieces or if somebody choked the, on your blanket and died or yeah, my, whatever. Yeah, my manufacturer licensee pays for the insurance. They have a, they have a policy. You, you, and that's license, in the agreement. Yeah, okay. yeah. So your license yeah. agreement will stipulate that they... I just Google target.com and I put super blankie and yeah. search. It's here. <laughs> the your, your licensee will have in the agreement, and if it's not there, you'll put it in there that they must carry X amount of liability insurance right. and you have to be named on the policy. Okay. And they indemnify you in case someone tries to go around and sue you in your Yes, ma'am. So, Karen, is it is it the um, pockets that make your blanket patentable? So my is utility it? patents are on that pocket. Okay, yeah. because so there are a lot can, of blankets. You, you can put it on a you can put it on a towel. A, a, you can put it on a piece of plastic, and my patent covers it. Oh. Doesn't okay. matter if anything is. You put your arms in and out like that. Oh, that's great. Yeah. It's yours. It's international. Is it or? Unfortunately not. Have you had knockoffs? Um, I've had somebody who has, has attempted to, to do some things with it. But, but you've got a legal team? Um, I, have, I have lawyers and I do have in my, um, in my uh, licensing agreement, that's something else you want to put in there, is that um, in the event I ever need to have any sort of litigation against the company, my manufacturer licensee will pay for that litigation. Awesome. They will they will cover and protect you against yeah. litigation. And yeah, if, and if you have to go after a, a knockoff, 
they will go after them. Yeah. So if I my agreement with Mattel, and it's true probably of, of you two, if uh, if I spot a knockoff, uh, I have to let them know. Right. And they will go. <coughs> after them. What are you going to get? It well, on I will say this. So I would have loved to have gotten the international patents, but they're very expensive. And you know, at the time I was innovating and working it, it just it, you got 12 months from the time you file your even provisional. Um, your the patent attorney is 12 months from the provisional. Right. Whether, yeah. you, whether your first filing is a provisional or not provisional. Yes. In either case, it starts at 12 month clock, and again, you need to get your patent applications on file in foreign countries within. Yeah. Yeah, let, me, so, let me let me clear oh, something up. You can also uh, just really quick. You can file what's called an international application. It's not associated yeah. with a particular country. It's associated with the World Intellectual Property Office. Oh, we file. And if you file back within the first twelve months, it buys you an extra year and a half. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. And to and to add to that, I attended <clears throat> last month at the patent office here at the satellite in Detroit. The whole day was a seminar on design patents. So whether, I know you have utility, mm -hmm. but also if you can create a design patent, it's good to capture that. You don't get the 23 years. But I am really now having learned more the state of the art of practice, and you are paying a lot for these fees. Pay a little bit more and file like what you're suggesting. WIPO, World Intellectual Property Organization, there's five core com uh, countries. Europe is considered a block, China, Korea, US and Canada, and it just turns out, and Windsor, we are so close to Windsor, that Windsor, just in the last couple months, they've updated and presented through this seminar through the patent office just like in the last month. Canada has stepped up, done everything to ISO standards, and so now if you go for Canada filing of WIPO, you just bring in five countries. So you, you know, if you got, there's a way and a good strategy, if, if you know, our members here in the room can, can capture that, it's, uh, it's the new approach that's much smarter. It costs a little bit more, but at the end you have global protection. Yeah. Let, let me add something about this whole patent <coughs> debate too, because uh, uh, patents are not protection in the way you're thinking they're protection. Patents really give you, uh, as well as copyrights, they give you a monopoly on that product. But it doesn't stop someone from knocking it off, okay? They're not gonna look at it and say, oh, this is patented, so let me back away. If they think there's enough money there, they will try to knock it off, okay? And the only thing recourse you have is to sue them. And that means someone has to dig in their pocket to pay for that litigation. So I'm not saying don't get patents, I'm just saying you have to be careful in how you think of them because yes, they're gonna help provide you uh, a, a monopoly ownership of that product or that uh, invention, whatever it is, but you have to enforce your rights, all right? And it's also more about, if you have a consumer product, more about the brand build, that's what you wanna do. You wanna get your name and you wanna be the one that the consumers want. I want everybody, to want a super blankie. If somebody else comes in and tries to copy and come after my market, I don't want, you know, they're not gonna want that. They want Why? the super blankie, because that's, Your, your you trademark know. is as much your as important as yeah. the patent. Because at the end of the day, again, your patent's going to expire at some point. So, and if you got a product that's a widget that has a limited lifespan, you know, like a lot of products, they're, they're flashes in the pan, they're around and hot for a couple, two or three years, and then you don't see or hear from, from them again. Why well, spend 50,000, 20,000, whatever the number is on a patent? Your energy should be focused on trademark and getting to the market as fast as possible. Get That's as like much the Pet Rock. Pet Rock sold for a few years and a few years and now. Right. So uh, that's just my opinion. Others might think differently. But your drive to the market is more important and getting a good trademark that people will remember and associate with that product. And that's long lasting and that's more important. Than, uh, than anything else. I'm not saying don't do a patent. In a lot of cases, it's very appropriate. But don't make that your first consideration. Because as I told you, 90 some odd percent of it, uh, issued patents to independent inventors at the end
end of the day, don't yield enough money to recover that cost. So you spend whatever you spend, you get a license deal, and I've known this happen to some <coughs> people. That product pays them a royalty for a relatively short period of time, and then it goes away, and they've never recovered the cost of the patent. And the product could be altered in some way, and they come out with it. Someone else comes out with a competing product. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of things that can happen. So again, I'm not saying don't get patents. I'm just saying approach this strategically uh, and, and consider whether a patent is really important for what <coughs> you're doing. How, what's the lifespan of this product potentially? Is the, is the innovation in that industry rapid? Because if there's rapid innovation in the industry you're in, then there's a good chance that while you may get your product out there for two or three years, someone else is going to innovate yours into obsolescence. So you, you have to be careful and look at all these things. Yes. Question again. Uh, you said uh, you spent six years producing your product or packaging your product. Mm -hmm. Were you able to keep up the demand? Yes. I mean, I started the basement. I was out of the basement in three months. <laughs> but <laughs> it was a warehouse, That's you know, facility, and manufacturing, the whole shebang. Employees, conveyor belts, warehouse, product stack here and there. So it did it all. So somebody had to help you on the manufacturing. You had to find the manufacturer, right? Or no, you did the manufacturing. I did the manufacturing. I did the production. Ma manufacturing is, maybe this is where we're a little confused. Mattel and Hasbro don't manufacture most of their products. Yet they're considered the manufacturer. Right. So, uh, they contract that work out to somebody else. Uh, Apple makes the iPhone, but do they make the iPhone? No. Okay. So in my industry, uh, you're considered a manufacturer. As long as you produce a product and your name is on it, you're the manufacturer, even though you may hire a company in China to actually produce it. In my case, I remember I said I bought all the components from other manufacturers, the cards from custom car builders or whatever. Assembled them and um, and stored in warehouse and that sort of thing is shipped. And I was considered a manufacturer, although I didn't make all the components. General Motors is a manufacturer, but do they make every part of the car? No, no. they're they're mostly assembly so, operations. Yeah. Uh, it's gentlemen. Uh, is, is 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 there a way to uh, uh, seek royalties from a a manufacturer that? that has a product out already and without altering the, their product, you uh, uh, offer them a, uh, a, a alternate use of, 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 of your product. So you're talking about basically adding to a product that's already no, out there, no, altering it? No, 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 without altering it, give them an idea of or another way, use. Uh, another use of yes. their product. Yes. Uh, that's a tricky one. I get that every now and then. Uh, we'll have to talk offline because that, that can be tricky. Well, somebody said, I asked that question. Uh, he told me, he said you have to go look at the claim on that patent and see if it covers that extra usage or something like that. Um, no. Because that's something different. So no. He's talking about, let's say you have a patented product. Mm -hmm. Looking at the claims is, is based on how the product is. Uh, the utility of the product, yeah, right. the components of it. It has nothing to do with the usage is what he's talking about. So um, it's a different thing, and that's a different animal to deal with. Because you're basically going to them and say, look, you've got this product, it's wonderful and awesome, and you're making a lot of money, but let me show you how you can, it can be used in another area, to another industry or right. demographic or whatever it might be. Right? But that's, a, that's a different animal. It's kind of tricky. So uh, we can talk offline. Yes, you can do that, though. The short answer. It's possible, but it depends a lot on the industry and the I just have a quick question for Karen. Yes, Karen. Um, yeah. Karen, um, when you made your presentation to the company that wound up being your licensee, yeah. um, did you have everything, like, um, did you do, um, you know, you had your program together, so and then did I you will, have a contract? I will, I will say this. I do have um, a licensing agent that assisted me. And I was very hands-on in it, very, very involved. Um, I'm not certain for me that having a licensing agent ne was a necessary thing ultimately. Um, best, but so, so we went in with a, um, a sell sheet, 
presented very professionally. Um, you know, when this was first asked whether or not there was open innovation happening in the company, and <coughs> there was. Um, and I have to say, too, I also was kind of at the right place at the right time because, as it happens, Target was talking to my manufacturer licensee at that time about coming in and build. And my licensee wanted to take a product to Target that was going to be a blanket and a superhero cape. But it was going to have like a fuzziness to it, but it was going to have a neckband on it. And then it was literally when I was knocking on my licensee's door at that same time. So Target was already talking to the licensee about, and I think it was Target's idea actually, that they wanted to have some sort of superhero cape blanket. You know, that's an interesting point, too, because in my industry that happens a lot, too. Uh, the retailers will go to the manufacturers and say, we, we're looking for something like this or something like that. So that board game, they send board game, came about as a result of Target approaching my licensee and saying, you know, we want something that Walmart doesn't have. We both sell the regular version of Phase 10. We want something different. Come up with it. So my licensee called me, Ken, you need something different, I came up with this, and we put it in Target. So uh, they will often make demands or requests of their uh, suppliers to come up with products, particularly new innovations or something to make them stand out from their competitors that they can have an exclusive on. Uh, let's, let's get this gentleman here. Ken, this is a bit of a nuts and bolts question. Does this constitute as children's sleepwear, i.e. must be flame retardant and yada yada, which then yeah, became that's a very part good question. of your mint? Because on your end, as the home sewer who makes it the first time, you're not beholden to those rules necessarily. I mean, you ought to think about them, but then you go and start producing on a larger scale, and it turns out, oh, I can't even use this material. So it's Did not? That fool around Yeah, I get it, I get it. Mm -hmm. It is not considered children's sleepwear. It is a, it is a blanket which is a great thing, too, when it comes to um, yeah, not just kind of import taxes. It's, it's, it's a blanket. It is, in fact, a blanket. Um, however, it, it has passed and has to go through a whole testing, mm -hmm. um, the Consumer Product Safety Commission testing, and all that, all those tests, it has to run through all that. And of course, my manu that's all in my licensing agreement. Mm -hmm. my, my manufacturer has to do all that and make sure that it's all done and well and safe and shows me that they passed the test and stuff. That's so. part of a license agreement. Your licensee has to make sure the product passes all regulatory requirements in right. that industry. In my industry, it's not a big problem with these games. It was a, a concern with the dice game. Uh, you mentioned choking. So uh, there are regulatory bodies that they have to pass this through, as well as color, uh, toxicity, is it yeah. right? Um, colors. Things like that, uh, the material that's made out of. So, but the, your licensee will be responsible and indemnify you from any liability. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, beginning this next Tuesday is the 2019 cohort for the Detroit Tech Exchange program through Tech Town Detroit. There will be about 30 or so college students and recent college graduates participating in this program. And it's a lean business startup accelerator. So we're going to be learning from serial entrepreneurs that have started a lot of businesses through their careers. And it's a great opportunity for us in here in Detroit, Southeast Michigan, to start our own companies. Now, uh, my company, or, or, or what, what's unique about this program is it, it focuses on the evaluation part of your, your process that you're explaining today. It's a part, uh, really focused on the customer discovery and the market discovery. So we will all be going out representing our own business ideas, maybe 10 or 12 different business ideas, engaging potential customers, surveying them, questioning them, uh, <coughs> seeking out those problems so then we can then design and develop our companies, our products, our services to these mutual problems. So now as we're going out in the community, th this seems like a new approach in design compared to the past, whereas in the past it seems companies do all this R&D, they create this widget, 
and then they figure out how to market it to the public. Now, whereas this model is going directly out to the public, finding the problem, then creating a solution to the problem, and then the, finding the value that way. So my, my question, to boil it down here, is uh, so I'll, I'll ask on behalf of the DTX uh, participants this season. Uh, it, we're, we want to be able to share our ideas so we can get feedback, so we can see what everyone thinks about our ideas. Yet at the same time, we want to secure our uh, intellectual property so we can properly be compensated for our efforts and not, that, not let that be in vain. So whereas in the past, it, there's been more of these siloed ideas and uh, they're very proprietary, now it seems that, that there's more sharing in the uh, so, so there's this co-opetition, and that's what, what I, how I'd like to see it. And I'm just curious, like, what do, we want, what do we want to share so we can create a better solution? We need to keep secret so it is not stolen from us. Yeah, so um, there are a couple things you can do. Of course, we talked about the NDA, right? So you get everyone to sign one of those. Another thing you can do in trying to get feedback uh, on the customer demand and that sort of thing, is to uh, pose your questions in such a way without revealing your solution. Okay, does that make sense? Yes. So you ask them, do they, do they ever uh, wish they could toast their bread? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and if they like toasted bread, how do you do that now? You see, if I haven't told them they're, they're going to figure out, I'm thinking of a toaster idea, but they haven't told them how I'm going to do it. Right. Right? So you can ask the questions without revealing your secret sauce on how you solve the problem. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. Uh, that's the way I generally ask people to approach you. Uh, because you really need that <clears throat> feedback. At the same time, you don't have to tell them your secret sauce. Okay? Uh, but in cases like games, you have to play it with people. You have to expose it. You have to let them... You know, why strip feedback and that sort of thing. So it's more of a uh, hands-on approach to the actual product. But if, uh, if you don't want to reveal the actual product, then ask questions that, that uncover their concerns about the problem and how they solve it and what they pay for a solution and that sort of thing without actually telling them your secret sauce on how you solve the problem. Hey, Ken, yes. what about uh, an organization like this where you have a fork? Don't you have a forum here for open discussion of ideas? Because anybody that's a member has signed an NDA. Isn't that right, Maria? Yeah, we do. And, and obviously, I want to put a great big caveat there. Um, your best protection is keep your cards close to your vest. Don't divulge your secret sauce. We're in a group of people. You can't control the person next to you, let alone a room full. So be smart about that. Um, disclosure, we, the, you know how we, uh, we got, I got all my board members well trained. Everybody who walked in here, please sign in, please sign in. Because at the bottom, we are agreeing that what is in this room and what is presented and released in this room mm -hmm. is kept confidential among the group, okay? But as the group grows and online platforms, how can you enforce it, right? So it is an issue, it is a concern. I, I've heard Ken say this to many people many times. And do phrase your questions smart. Do say what you're trying to ask your questions. You're here and you wouldn't drive and come to Lawrence Tech uh, you know, on Thursday nights to spend three, four, three hours and then some if it wasn't important for you to be here. And we honor and respect that. But at the same time, there's really limited enforcement. And I mean, you can pay lawyers a lot of money, but once the cat's out of the bank, the cat's out of the bank. Yeah, I would second that. And plus, like, as a matter of practice, it's just good not to get in the habit of sharing what you have. So even in here, if you feel like it's a little bit more of an open environment, like, just so, like, you know, uh, it's just safer to train yourself not to share your secret sauce necessarily, and even in a group like this. Yes, sir. Two quick questions to the attorney. I was told that once you place your product, whatever it is, on Facebook or something, it's public domain, you cannot get a patent for it. That's not true. That's not, that's, that's not true. Okay, and then the second thing to you guys, your packaging looks great, so did you include the 
increase the price of what that is because <coughs> when you first built it, you didn't have a packaging for it, and you got a great package. Do you go to a packaging company to do that? Oh, yeah, this, again, this is all done by my manufacturer, and there was a, a gold price point that I believe Target had pointed out, the fourteen ninety nine. So that when they're getting, and again, my, my licensee is not a manufacturer. They have the factories that they go to in China. Um, and, and when you developed this and presented it to them, you didn't have this packaging, right? I did not have this packaging. Right. I had that red blanket. <laughs> so so you know, my, my point there is you don't have to worry about the packaging. Yeah. They're concerned about the product. Right. If you come up with, if I presented this to Mattel today, I guarantee you they would change it. So they will have their own packaging and design, uh, yeah, it's but it's the product itself you need to concern yourself with. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. It's just a pleasure to be here. I'm just getting educated yeah, yeah. and getting knowledge, and I'm going to have to buy that because I'm like, what? What is he saying? What's going on? But I wanted to ask you a question. You probably already said it, but I'm really just kind of getting yeah, into this whole lot. thing. But you said when you went to the store, and I'm so proud of you. I, I want one of those. I, I wish you had like an adult one. <laughs> we ought to have Karen oh, come back and, and have the entire yeah. hour and a half to tell her story. She just kind of yeah. Karen, yeah, we want you back. We're we want Karen back, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Peter's always here, so we can always ask him questions. We'll give him, we'll give him an hour and a half too. No, 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 no it's all right. <laughs> but you said when you went into the store, you said you went to the area where you, where you wanted to see. Yeah. So did you go to the, the blanket, the kids? I went right into the blanket okay. section. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the then kids that's when you blanket section. checked on the bottom, and then that's when you found I, you should yeah. go. Yeah, and I, you know, I wanted, I wanted to have a Batman okay. blanket, so I went and looked at the Batman blankets that were there, and I said, who's making Batman blankets? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. The Remember I said earlier, you go to the competitors. Yes. People that are do already that doing it, that's yes. who you go to. You can also look you know, on Amazon yeah. and online. There's a lot of manufacturer information that's got to oh, be in there. Okay. Yes. What about an adult version of this? <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. My licensee, I gave them a limited license. Mm -hmm. um, so they are not permitted to make adult size blankets. I want them to. I want to write that in the contract, but they don't want it. Okay. Because that's a whole other level. So that's great, though. So now you've reserved so excluded, those rights. And you've I've reserved license my rights. Else. Yeah. So oh, I've been, cool. I've been trying great. to work that. So she got a very good deal because her her uh, licensee was much more flexible. Mm -hmm. I saw the early drafts of her agreement, mm -hmm. and they were much more flexible mm -hmm. than I would have imagined. I think I told you then they're going to want exclusivity. They're going to want this. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that agreement. I said, Wow, they don't care about exclusivity. They don't care. Everything no, I, I mean, thought. What, they, what they have the exclusive right to do yeah, is, is make child size blankets in exactly. and and third party licensed characters. Okay. But, but I can. For other but I can if I want to go and have another licensee <coughs> make <coughs> butterflies and rainbows and stars, mm -hmm. I can have that. Okay. And with the kid with the egg, I'm, I'm sorry. The kid with the egg, did they, yeah. they brought that idea to you or did you come up with the idea? Well, I, I was hitting them up because I'm in communication with them all the time. I said, we got we to gotta talk to this Ryan kid. Okay. <laughs> we, we need, this kid has got to endorse the blanket. We got to, we got to. Mm -hmm. So, um, but at the same time, so Pocket Watch is the, let's say the manager, the talent manager of this kid and a bunch of other YouTube stars. Okay. So Pocket Watches, call them, like, they're like a Warner Brothers, they're like an entertainment organization. Okay. Yeah. So did your licensee go through? So my licensee went to Pocket Watch, started talking to Pocket Watch to get access to Ryan. Mm. So brought it all together. So. That's pretty cool. I have a, a little cousin in, in California that he's like a piece of YouTube celebrity, oh. literally. Your cousin is? Yeah, he's a, he's a little boy. Um, you know what I'm saying. So I have a family. Well, tell me who he is. Yeah, I'll you say what now? <laughs> like he 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 likes watching them. No, I'm saying he is a little celebrity. So he YouTube so he yeah, like, YouTube there's like yeah. so of course Ryan is on YouTube and he's got this blanket and he tries it on. Now there's like all these videos coming out of the little YouTube stars that got have. You. 40,000 likes or visitors, right? Okay. And they're trying on the Ryan's blanket, and they're that like, so and they're cool. making their own videos. It's um, crazy. My son no, is going to uh, Bentonville next month. Oh, is that right? Yeah, he's going to Bentonville. 
and um, he's already talked to uh, the top senior buyer, uh, Kena Thomas or whatever, and she wants to do business with my family. And so some of the products that my, my middle boy has with my uh, cousin in California who's already on YouTube, um, we've already thought about endorsing him and giving him like the products and kind of letting him model it and stuff out. So for me to see that, it's like, it's, it's very encouraging. Yeah. Is there any other? Yes, sir. So here, here's, can I get it right? That you didn't have any sales at all before you went to the university? That's right, uh, at least for mine. Um, all I had was the patents because what I was trying to do was to force the claims into the three patents that we got. Um, there were, I ran into like up to 10 companies that were infringing on our patents. So what I, what I did was uh, call, them, call them and ask them, if, or I informed them of what I believed was to be true, that they were violating terms of our patents and, and so I didn't say anything about litigation or anything. I just said, would you like to buy a license? Um, and so we started negotiating. Karen, is that true? What, that how about you? Did you, did you have some sales? I did, I, but again, I was selling the red, that red blanket and, and different t t uh, colors and I put rainbows and start, you know, different stuff on. Um, so I did, but uh, everything that I was making, I never paid myself. I paid for my patents and my trademarks. I was just paying putting money back in the so business. And then later she said the licensee had to take care of all the certifications, all, oh, the, yep. all of that. So yep. before that, you were kind of floating, kind of Oh, risky. I just had, I mean, I was I mean, just doing. stuff, but it could have been. Uh, I was doing have. craft shows in Michigan. I was doing. Yeah. You know, small level like that. And, yeah. You know, you know, you know, the FBI is not going to kick her door okay. or something. Yeah. <laughs> and, and then the but, question, yeah. so, so Ken, is that typical? That most people hardly have no sales or yes. very few sales? I, That's normal. I would even say that if I, if I had, I mean, based on things that were happening in my life at the time, if I did this again, first thing I do, I go straight to licensing. I wouldn't try to venture. Most, most uh, licensing because like results when you have no product. I mean, you have, you have never produced it other than a prototype. Yeah. You've never sold it. You never saw the sales. You've just created a prototype that works. You show it to them. They think it works. They want to bring it in. They don't care if you've not had sales. If you've had sales, though, that requires you to start a business in a lot of cases. I mean, we talked about that before. In my case, I started a business, had been doing so at the largest retailer in the country. And if you have done that, then getting a license deal is a slam dunk. But again, it may be something you shouldn't do. It depends on the business and, and the product and your resources, your business acumen, a lot of things. So if you can produce a product and prove the concept that it sells, like you've seen on Shark Tank, right? They get excited when they've had sales. Mm -hmm. So a licensee will get excited if you've had sales, but it's not a requirement. Why? Okay. I'm sorry, did you finish your first <coughs> steps? I know I got the first two steps. Yeah, uh, so you've got the evaluation, you've got the prototype, you've got the evaluation of the prototype, you've got a provisional patent application, if that's what you want, is potentially a patent. Or you could use that PPA to give you perceived ownership of something and then go to a licensee within that year uh, to try to get a license agreement or make sure that sales or whatever else you're trying to do before that year expires. So your PPA followed by your um, your IP registration, whatever that might be, you file your patent application. On step five, you uh, secure your copyrights, your trademarks, whatever IP you want, step five. Then step six is to either license or start a business. Wow. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, which is the correct <coughs> month to uh, start uh, a PPA? So that uh, you get uh, the maximum leverage with the licensee. Good month. Uh, which is a good month. Just uh, if you know your idea, you file. It's putting your stake in the ground, and then you've got 12 months. Uh, patent law in 2013 changed where it's first to file. So if you tell your second cousin, or he looks over your shoulder, and he goes and he beats you for the filing because you're waiting for the right month. Guess what? He's going to be the one who can qualify for the patent and not you. The, the reason I'm asking is, um, 
I know that ice manufacturers so they may target like uh, like customers. So you know, new designs are accepted on a certain month or no, accept no, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, so in my business, obviously Christmas fall is a big time of year. But if I license something to Mattel today, it might not hit the market for a year, oh, year wow. and a half. Okay. okay. But you can still do it. Okay. You can still do it. So that don't worry about considerations of when a good time is, because you're not going to hit the right time uh -huh. anyway. And by the time they you negotiate, it took us. Well, I won't count Mattel because it was kind of quick. They were under the gun, but it still took us about a month to negotiate the deal. Uh, the previous licensee it took us three months to negotiate the license. Okay. So. You don't know how long that's going to take, so just go for it. And when they bring it in, they will know when it's introduced. In our case, Toy Fair is every February, and they want all their new licensed product in and prototypes made because they don't manufacture uh, 100,000 new games before they actually go to retailers to find out if they want to buy it. Right. So they'll make a bunch of prototypes uh, or production-ready uh, samples take them to Toy Fair, get orders, then they get production. <coughs> one, one, one last uh, loaded question. Uh, are you guys open to uh, uh, getting any new ideas, acting as intermediary for whatever with the manufacturers? Because you have already uh, a good reputation and experience. So are you open to taking any new ideas and bringing them to the market? If you got a toy or a game, I'd be happy to help you. Okay. Get you a tell. Yeah, tell I, has I, I to. But if you've somebody, got, you know, if I can finish, if you've got, you know, finish, if you've got oh, something that's outside of my industry, you can find agents who are in that industry that do that for you. Okay. If you have, uh, if you go to talk to a licensee and they send you a, a potential licensee and they send you a draft of a license agreement, I'll be happy to look at it for you <coughs> and give you a first look of what I think you need to add to it because it will be missing a couple of items, I'm sure. Okay. Thank you. Oh, you I'm sorry, but this yeah, over here. If somebody needs an hour, you want to come, I will, I meet here at Lawrence Tech Library, and if you need an NDA, I will give you an hour. I typically will give someone an hour and meet them for coffee. Cool. Yes. About how much? But pay your membership. It's <laughs> 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 about how much does a licensee cost, or is that something out, uh, Cost you? Nothing. Did you guys pay for No, you? no, no, you don't pay anything. They, well, they pay, pay you. you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <I'm> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so, we'll leave your so, your, your <laughs> licensee is, it's not, it doesn't cost you anything. She has to try to. She tried to. Oh, an agent. I'm sorry. Uh, an agent, uh, it depends.